Thanks very much. I think the most important takeaway was the fact that beekeepers have better mentorship than most junior faculty. So I want to talk a, a little bit about a, a topic that's been, uh, that's been really quite important to me. I'm a, an internist and a medical informatician and uh, help lead innovation programs at our medical center that are technology enabled and technology fueled. And clearly now as we are, are in a different era of the practice of medicine, something that I'm sure has been a theme uh, throughout this conference and has been uh, reinforced in all of the things around us, Technology is accelerating changes that are happening, both for the better and for the worse, in the way that we practice medicine and the way that we interact with our patients um, and our healthcare systems. Clearly now, we are in this new era of medicine where we are dealing with active and engaged patients. This is a good thing. This is a great thing. This is a challenging thing, and it's one that we are, are often ill-equipped to deal with and unprepared to deal with where we're moving towards a model of continuous care as opposed to the episodic care that reigned supreme under the fee-for-service era. And we're certainly moving towards a model of interprofessional teams of providers, something that is still not yet standard of practice in medical school curricula, but is one thing that will truly make the delivery of care in this country, uh, in this country great. We're seeing fewer and fewer patients in the hospital. And the length of stay of those patients who are admitted is, is dropping precipitously. This is a, a graph of length of stay by age. You can just see that over the past few decades, it's basically halved. But there are just a fraction of the number of patients in the hospital than there were before. Uh, and what patients are being admitted to the hospital for is changing as well. Our medical center uh, last month performed its first outpatient hip a replacement procedure, which is something that even five years ago, I would never have even imagined as being possible. We're going to see an aging population, a continuing rapid growth of subspecialists. People are still choosing to go into subspecialties at a much higher rate than primary care, and a greater accountability for costs. We just heard about uh, some accountability for costs that I wasn't even aware of, which were kind of scary, but that it's a big part of the way that we practice medicine. Now, all of this is happening, and this is scary, and, and, and these are changes where we need to teach our medical students, residents, and practicing physicians differently, but it's happening in a time where technology is transforming the delivery of care and our ability to gather information from our patients and for our patients to gather information about themselves. Here's three examples of devices that are contributing to ubiquitous and cheap clinical data. On the top left is a fingertip pulse oximeter with wave tracing, $17 on Amazon.com. Anyone can buy this device. If you ask the medical students in the room, most of them already own these devices and carry around them on rounds. The bottom is a single lead EKG machine. It's an iPhone 5 case. I always carry one with me. I do a single lead EKG on every one of the patients I see in clinic. Uh, and page, this went off. Uh, this went uh, over the counter about a month ago or two months ago, so patients can buy that for themselves. If they pay a monthly fee, every EKG they do is sent up to the cloud, and a board-certified cardiologist reads the EKG and the result is pushed back down to their phone. Amazing. Some people are using these two devices, the pulse oximeter and the phone, to do home-based sleep studies for about 300 bucks, as opposed to a hospital-based, very uncomfortable sleep study for about $3,000. And in the top right is handheld ultrasonography, now down to just $5,000 a device. Some medical schools are actually purchasing these devices for all of their medical students. And medical students are walking around with more technology in their white coat pocket than our hospitals had 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And they can do point of care imaging, they can do point of care data collection, and increasingly the patients themselves can do this as well. The patients now have at their fingertip consumer-facing healthcare diagnostics and tests that are mind-blowing. Here's an example, this is a, and I don't endorse any of these products, by the way, even though I am carrying one of them in my pocket, but I think that these are just transformative examples. So this is a company called Ubiome, where patients can send in samples and they sequence the different bacteria in the different parts of their body and give the patient back a report, which I'll show you in a second, of their microbiome. Now, the microbiome is a new topic. It's one where we're studying the different distribution of, of organisms that live in different parts of our body and how those organisms can have a signaling relationship with our own bodies and influence health. 
This is very cutting edge. This is very complex. But here is a company right now where if you pay 89 bucks, you can send one sample from your gut. But if you buy the 399 five site kit, you can send a variety of different swabs from different parts of your body to uh, have them look at the distribution of bacteria in those areas. And this is what the report looks like that the patient gets back, where it shows them the distribution of these bacteria and where, how you compare to the average people that they sequenced in those populations. And here at the bottom, it shows you that these bacteria are where you, where you, show, where you are and how you compare it to the confidence of, of the population. Now, when you read this website, of course, it tells you to take this report to your doctor and work on it together. And it shows you how you can compare if you exercise, how you can change your genital urinary flora if you exercise. Now, I don't know how many of you are primary care physicians, but if your patient walked in the room, you most likely would not be able to pronounce any of these bacteria, much less understand what you're looking at. But the patient has this at their fingertips. The patients can purchase this and bring this and want to make uh, choices about their own health or understand predictions of health and wellness based on this information. This is a pretty extreme example, but one that's, that's much more, more uh, straightforward and much more common are consumer-facing cancer risk predictors. So this is a company, getcolor.com, which does saliva-based uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer testing. And when you send in a sample, they do se uh, sequencing to look at mutations across these 19 different genes. And when they, just like the previous provider, go through the different steps of this process, Step four is to create a plan with your, with your healthcare provider. So the patient has the opportunity to directly access these tests, to get them to get decision support on what they mean from, their, from these consumer-facing labs and to bring them back uh, to the provider and add in this data to your doctor-patient relationship. Oftentimes tests that you cannot order in your hospital or clinic. These are, are really cutting edge things and they're dramatically impacting the way we interact with our patients. Now though these are sophisticated genetic tests, but many states are actually making this much easier for patients to take a more active role and just order any blood test that they want. There are amazingly 28 states now permit patients to order their own blood tests. Uh, and get them from a lab. They have to pay for them themselves. Insurance won't pay for the test when the patient orders it. Uh, this was in the news a lot recently because Arizona just passed a bill that kicks in in July, which allows patients there to order their own tests. And they literally will go and, and they can pick from a menu, order their own cholesterol, blood chemistries, uh, CBC, what have you, and get, it, get the results directly from, from the laboratory itself. And the state laws that have this enacted oh, do not hold the provider responsible to review or act on the results. However, I think all of us who take care of patients would certainly feel obligated to do so uh, and would want to be informed of this. And they protect the providers from liability. And I, I mean, we'll hear, we can hear more of the legal perspective, um, given that these tests were not author, authorized by or ordered by uh, a physician. And the patient must receive the results themselves. Now, here, this is just, this is really wild, right? Patients can make the choice about what they want. They can drive the frequency of this testing and then bring these data back along uh, with all the other things I showed you into that medical visit and really change that dynamic. So right now, we struggle with medication reconciliation. And, and here, we're going to have this opportunity with our patients to now do test reconciliation as they themselves become the orderer and proprietor of so much of their clinical data. Patients are increasingly active and uh, um, as in addition to what they're doing in terms of getting the opportunity to order all these blood tests and work on it, they're organizing themselves in really very impressive uh, and robust ways. So this is a website called Patients Like Me, which is a site that organizes groups of patients around specific diseases or illnesses that they might have. Um, and empowers them to communicate with each other, to support each other, to share the latest scientific evidence and literature, to help them communicate with providers and get the care that they need. 
And one example from that website is the fact that the patients and this, this uh, organization have partnered with, with clinical trial providers and others to, pr to make it easy for patients with diseases to enroll themselves in clinical trials. And if you go on this website, they have 46,000 clinical trials broken down by the different disease types to match patients and to, to help patients get access to cutting-edge research-based care. I think this is a, a very healthy sign of, of our healthcare system and one in which activated and engaged patients are going to potentiate the, the initiatives being created by the scientific mission. Um, and, it, and it really is terrific. But this is all happening at a pace that we just never saw before in healthcare. Uh, this is an infographic that shows uh, examples of data and connectedness uh, by the proxy of how many years it took for these various technologies to reach 50 million people. And you'll see at the very top it took the telephone 75 years to reach 50 million people, the TV 13 years, and down there at the bottom it took Angry Birds 35 days to reach 50 million people. So, we're, by the way, we're all in the wrong business. We got to just be in the Angry Birds business uh, if, you, if you really want to have a big impact. That's amazing, Th 35 days to have a communications infrastructure bi-directionally collecting information from and pushing, pe pushing information to people in 35 days, 50 million people, amazing. All through their mobile devices, a platform which, with which we can gather so much information and data about patients. And down here at the bottom, the EPIC uh, electronic medical record, which is the most popular used electronic medical record in the country, has about 54% of the population of the United States uh, patients on it in one way or another. That's 150 million U.S. patients are being cared for on, on this single platform. So this opportunity for data and bringing it all together is bigger than ever. Eric Topol, who's a physician at Scripps, who is a sort of a futurist and a really excellent thinker. He's written a few books and uh, is a, just a, a very smart person who talks about this stuff. He summarized this in a recent tweet where he talks about these, these contrasts between old and new medicine. And these are ones that, are, that certainly resonate with me and I think they'll resonate with you as well. Certainly we're, we're moving um, from this, and I think it's crazy to think that the old medicine was population based because many of us think of old medicine as being very anecdotal and individual patient. Uh, but from population based to individualized or personalized or precision medicine from the concept of the visit in the clinic to real-time streaming of data or information or communication with your patients. That's, that's challenging. That's a different model of thinking about healthcare. Of doctor-ordered data to patient-generated data, just like I showed you with those tests. I didn't even mention the Apple Watch. Who knows what that's going to do uh, for, for patients' healthcare. From this concept of, of documentation about a patient and the patient narrative in the medical record being determined by the care provider team that's taking care of the patient to exclusion of the patient to one that includes the patient and can have actually this concept of notes being edit, edited or annotated by patients, um, which is a real dramatic change. This concept that information should be owned by its rightful owner, right now there are still tremendous barriers to patients owning their data uh, and to our ability to own some data that patients collect from other different sources. And the fact that many of these technologies are just going to become increasingly less expensive and a move away from data limited to panoramic data, this real ubiquitous look at patients from their activity to their genome to their diet to their uh, laboratory tests to a true 360 degree view of them. We were really taught about medicine in this fashion. This is the, the cockpit of a 1936 biplane. This is an analog plane. There are dials that just show raw data, the wind speed, your altitude. Uh, there's no radar in this plane. The pilot can only see as far as, as they can, can with their eyes. And when you want to fly this plane and you move that stick, it moves wires that physically pull the different flight surfaces, and, and, uh, and that's how you affect system change inside this. It's also flown by a single person who has to make decisions on their own. 
But, and I know you had an actual astronaut speak to you, but this is what healthcare is now, right? This is what the, the patient walking in the room with the printouts of their microbiome genome sequence and their own lab tests and their Apple Watch activity breakdown for the past six months, this is what that integrated with your electronic medical record and those 27 reminders that you need to fulfill and your RVU graph, uh, how those things all interact. And this cockpit is designed to help people make decisions based on so much data that it would overwhelm them individually. This is a system that helps you make decisions and provides decision support tools. There isn't any raw data on these screens. These are summaries. This is the computer interpreted, uh, interpreted information about what the pilots are seeing. And also, this is a team of people. You can't fly this aircraft by yourself. You need an interdisciplinary team of different people with different roles who are all working together. And even though this is a $7 billion aircraft, just like our $7 billion hospitals with all the latest technology, there's still pieces of paper stuck all over everything, just like the real hospital. So <laughs> that's going to be forever, no matter how much, uh, how much technology we have. So here we are in the middle of all of these exciting changes. And I think that these changes are exciting, and I think that these are transformative opportunities for all of us. But we are going to face great challenges as we make this transition. And if we, as physicians and the healthcare system and providers, don't help navigate this, we'll become a victim of this. So we need to really, truly face these challenges in a, in, a, in a very robust way. The first challenge, of course, is data overload. Many of us feel like we're already there, but this is going to only get greater and greater, the pace of which is going to get faster and faster. The second one is around this, this fundamental change in what our relationship is with the patient. It may no longer be episodic visits that have a specific level of intensity and a specific code. Um, it may be this real-time streaming that we just talked about with Eric Topol. And if so, what does that mean for our reimbursement or for the quantification of what the healthcare relationship is with the patient? And the next is who pays, and I don't mean who pays the physician because I'm hoping, and the new recent SGR reform is beginning to improve reimbursement for telemedicine, but who pays for all this infrastructure? Increasingly, as we see this consumer-facing health devices and consumer-facing technology, it's the patient that pays for their Apple Watch or for that genetic test. Um, who's going to pay for all this infrastructure in the future? Who's going to pay for the increased uh, electronic medical record ubiquity? Federal government has played a large part in that. Hospitals have as well. It's a key question that's going to be answered. Unfortunately, it's being answered in an environment where these technologies are becoming cheaper and cheaper. The next one is one that makes a lot of people quite uncomfortable. The fact that the locus of control is shifting away from the physician, very appropriately to interdisciplinary teams. I don't know whether it's appropriate that it's shifting entirely or very much so to the patient side. I think, it, I think it's a good thing and I think it's empowering. But the physician still remains accountable. We just heard about uh, malpractice. That, that's an issue, and the accountability of these care and the ability to coordinate care that's becoming increasingly discoordinated in a, in a decentralized and healthy way is one that, that is a challenge. And the last point on, on this slide is the fact that doctors take care of patients and not computers. And we really emphasize that rapport building, that human relationship as part of our medical school curricula because it is important and it's something that our patients are looking for. If you talk to patients, what, one of their most common complaints after the fact that they only had seven minutes talking to their provider was that the provider was looking at the computer screen the whole time. The provider was typing the whole time. They weren't turning and looking at me or talking to me and the patient's bearing their soul and this person's checking boxes and trying to get through as many epic reminders as they possibly can. We need to get past this. We need to get into a, a system where that human element and that rapport becomes the main thing, that that trust maintains its primacy. I don't know what that looks like when the re relationship is through apps pushing text messages between us and our patients, but it's something that we can figure out and it's something that we will figure out. And it's something that no matter what happens is going, we know is going to remain important to all of our patients. I'm a huge optimist and I'm a huge fan of all these technologies, so I think that these, these pose tremendous opportunities, these changes, and the new technologies. The first is the fact that there's access. Now it's not yet cheap enough for this to be realized, but the fact that patients 
and providers can have access to these technologies, to these tests, and to healthcare education and healthcare information all over the world, no matter what social, political, religious barriers might exist wherever they are, is something that is going to help fuel this transformation in global public health and in the reach and effectiveness of healthcare. That by itself does not guarantee improved outcomes, and there's been a million examples of that, but this really is going to set the stage for transformation. If we break down the silos between the knowledge and access of healthcare, uh, which has been trapped inside the ivory tower for so long, and make it much more accessible, much more global, appropriately uh, human mentored, this is going to have a tremendous public health benefit to everyone. And it's going to align patients and the healthcare systems and healthcare providers. It's going to allow us to create a joint mission and it's going to allow us to create uh, a, a real, real synergy where we're working together against shared common enemies, which are the insurance companies. I'm just kidding, that's a, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> And then the last point here is, is that these technologies can offer enhanced flexibility for patients. I mean, for, for physicians and for patients as well. Um, we, I, I heard a question last, in the last session about the fact that there are 150 students in a medical school class and only 30 of them show up to lecture. That's an opportunity because that lecture is being time shifted by being screencasted. That's an opportunity for that faculty member to think about different models of delivering their content. And so too, does this free us up to have different models, if they're reimbursed, to interact with our patients? The second one is, is really the adaptivity, this opportunity that, that Eric Topol talked about of moving from the population to the individual. Um, the fact that if we have truly panoramic data about our patients that we can deliver personalized and individualized care. We do that really well when we sit and talk to the patient and understand their viewpoint and have this communication. But when it comes to tests and medications and clinical trials, that's where we don't do it very well. Um, and I think that the, the introduction of all of this technology and the ubiquity of the data is going to enable us to, to do some things that we just couldn't do before to support each patient's unique needs. The first is virtual health coaches for patients. These have not, have not been super successful up until now, but I think that with uh, wearables like the Apple Watch and other devices becoming more ubiquitous, we're going to see systems that help patients get healthy and stay healthy and engage them in a way that is in connection with and parallel to the healthcare system, but not overly burdensome to the healthcare providers that are taking care of that patient. And just like our patients need decision support tools to keep them healthy based on their data and to give them feedback if they're going in the right direction or what preventive tests they need, et cetera, so too do we need help on the provider side to make sense of all this. We need that space shuttle cockpit. Some of that's in our electronic medical record systems, but that's really just the, the, very, the very beginning and the, the earlier, earliest iteration. One example that you've read about is IBM's Watson system. That's the system that won Jeopardy. Uh, but they're really finding that a lot of the use is going to be in healthcare. This is essentially a supercomputer that IBM built that reads all of the literature in a particular field and then figures out how the different concepts in that medical literature connect to each other and can therefore then answer questions that people pose of it. So they'll have it read literally the entire oncology literature, which won't take this thing very long. And then they'll be able to pose questions of what a particular patient with a particular illness who's received a uh, preceding set of, of treatment might need. And this thing can, can understand what those concepts are in that literature and provide recommendations and guidance across all of that body of knowledge and change over time as it continuously reads new things as it comes out. Those are exactly the types of systems that we need to have as providers uh, to make sense of this all. It's not, it's not human knowable and as I said that problem is only going to uh, get more complex. The next one is this move towards predictive care in addition to preventive medicine predicting what's going to happen to a patient based on other patients like them and their trajectories, based on their genome, based on their blood tests, et cetera. Um, this continuous data collection will enable us to predict what's going to happen as opposed to react. And we've been a largely reactive healthcare system, and that's kind of the way that we're, that we're uh, taught in, in medical school as well. 
Um, and I think that this move from, from purely reactive and preventive to predictive will be another that really dramatically impacts the way we make decisions. So I'll, I'll end with this, and, and this is really where uh, I'm particularly interested in and, and an area that is, is changing many medical school curricula. The fact that we as physicians, the teams that we work with, the nurses, the uh, physician's assistants, the social workers, the mental health professionals, everyone that we work with are going to need a new set of skills in this new era. And these are skills that some medical schools are beginning to teach, uh, but these are skills that many of us did, definitely did not learn in medical school. The first is just the skills of using the electronic uh, health record. And I don't mean to say uh, using it like where you should click, the concepts of how to use it effectively, how to manage your care and your practice with it. They've done time in motion studies, and most non-procedural physicians spend between 45 and 55 percent of their time doing information management, the single largest activity of clinical care. And yet, teaching the skills of this are largely absent from medical school curriculum. The second are data and technology competencies, understanding large data sets, understanding their strengths and weaknesses, understanding their limitations, and, and a little bit about how to, how to interpret them how to use technologies, what the uh, weaknesses are, what the risks are, how they can be used most appropriately, and where their use is inappropriate. And this is something that's going to be very, uh, that's going to take up a lot of our bandwidth um, as, as the churn of new devices and software becomes bigger. The second is or the third is population and panel level thinking. Not just looking at that individual patient in front of you, but using these data to look at all of your diabetic patients. Some healthcare systems are doing this particularly well, but many physicians, especially those in, in smaller practices in the community, still don't yet have the tools to do this easily, and they want to improve their care. The next is our virtual teamwork skills. Up until now, we've been really focused on teams of people who interact like humans do by speaking to each other, uh, but increasingly as we see decentralized care or continuity of care, virtual communication among healthcare providers is going to become more and more and more important. You already see it now when you order a consult on a patient in the hospital, you read the note from the consultant, but how many times do you never speak to that other person in person? So the skills of understanding how to use virtual teams most effectively to improve care, and by the way, the patient is definitely a member of that virtual team, uh, will become really quite important. The next is agility and lifelong learning, which are cliche among, among medicine, but it's so true. Our field is just being transformed by changes in the healthcare delivery system, as I showed during the beginning, the structure, function, and finances of care, the legal aspects of care. But the technological revolution that's going to happen in medicine and is being driven by advances in genomics, advances in testing, and is plummeting in price is going to sweep us by if we, don't, uh, if we don't stay on top of it and continue to learn about these things. And the last is, uh, is, is rapport building and boundaries. We want to make sure that these technologies don't become that screen that's physically in between us and the patient, that we still maintain this communication and this hum human connection with our patients. But we, in this new era, also need to understand the boundaries of the provider-patient relationship. When your patient is friends with you on Facebook and comments on your personal posts, uh, that's probably a boundary that most people will debate. And this will also become something that is uh, more and more of a challenge and one that we need to more actively manage as we go uh, into the future. But it is, again, a tremendous opportunity. So I'll, I'll stop with that saying that I think we're at this really fascinating tipping point. I think that medical schools, residency programs, and CME programs are starting to play catch up, but they're far behind the pace at which technology is transforming all this. I think it's just awesome that our patients are, are far ahead of us. They are uh, adopting these technologies. It's, it's slow, but it's, it's gaining speed. They are using them to improve their health. They're using them to change the way they interact with the healthcare system and becoming more empowered. And we, as healthcare providers, have this opportunity to use these tools and to use these data to be a much more impactful and much more thoughtful and predictive doctor of tomorrow. Thank you very much.